They began writing books. That's how C.S. Lewis got saved, right? right. Reading his novels. And poor guy about starved to death. McDonald? Yeah, George MacDonald. Tolkien got saved too by reading him. He became a, you heard Finney in 43, he began to study it and began to preach. It had great meeting in Scotland. Well, the Calvinists were going bats. So they got together, <clears throat> had a big trial on, declared him a heretic, and closed every pulpit. Hmm. Because you see, Calvinism was his state religion. Oh, yeah. Not Christianity, Calvinism. I don't, I don't, I don't equate Calvinism with Christianity like they, those people. <laughs> Boy. He's got a book on the miracles, fellas. I was reading it when my sister was dying. In Mark's book. Oh, man. On the miracles. See, Jesus come along, first, Christ, first leader in the world. If you believe in me, you have life eternal. Nobody ever said that before. And furthermore, he takes Peter... And John, he up on Mount Transfiguration, he brings up Moses and Elijah as an object lesson. He says, here, I show you. I show you. And they, they spent the afternoon up there with him. Well, not long after that, he comes down. Woman comes, would you come pray for my brother Lazarus? He's sick. You're real serious, he's about to die. She said, I'll come. He, I'll come. But he didn't come in those four days, and he died. So three or four days afterwards, he comes to Mary and said, now Mary, I want to see Lazarus. Oh, it's too late, the Lord. He died. Take me to the grave. Take me to the tomb. And he said, no, nah. he rolled it away, and now he said, get these people out of here. <laughs> and he goes in there. I love this. Don't you ever forget, he says, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said Lazarus, he'd have emptied that whole cemetery. <laughs> See, he not only preached the eternal life, he showed him he could bring it. See, what such... Great object lesson that the man, he raised many from the dead. We, he, he just doesn't tell us all of them. Oh, mm -hmm. he's dead in a doornail. <laughs> Confucius, all these other religions, they're, they're phony as three dollar bills. But boy, in this guy's book on miracles, whoo, whoo, man alive, I can preach on that and you'll want to die in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of these fundamentals want to live till they're thousands, don't they? They say, this world's not my home. Yeah, go look at their home. You see, they think they're going to live there 500 years. <laughs> All right? Okay. How long? Where'd he go? He's right there. Well, now, what is this? What are we, am I supposed to do a jig or something here with that? Uh, no, they just want it. It's evidence. <laughs> 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 oh, and you mean if you're yeah. if you were arrested for being a Christian, no. would there be no. enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> we all got to answer that one, don't we? Yeah. Well, what am I supposed to do? I don't know if um, anybody had questions. You know, if you don't have any questions, you're dead. <laughs> and you don't know it. You're too lazy to lay down. <laughs> did, did you guys ever had a chance to ask them about original sin? Yeah, yeah no, that was... They were hoping to. Yeah. They were hoping to. Well, start hoping. <laughs> I think one of the, the passages is a little irksome in Romans 5. Romans 5, 17 and 19. Both tell me the same thing. 
Uh, why don't you get a Bible and you can use that one in mind and that. Uh, um, before you read this, I want to quote you a verse. From 1 Corinthians 15, 22. This is a verse they teach universalism. Hannah mm -hmm. Whitehall Smith became a universalist. She changed a lot of guys to being universalists, like Gypsy Smith, one of the three top well known evangelists in the world, before he died, became a universalist. Mm -hmm. this, this woman teach. And she did it with. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two. Why don't you turn there? Right. When did she become the universalist? I mean, was it, she wrote a couple books. Was it during the books or before? Latter part. Latter part. How about that the hearing heart? I had read that by her. That seemed pretty good. I think it was one of her first books. Talked about Solomon, King Solomon, and his prayer to the Lord. No, I'm thinking of Hannah Bernard. Uh, somebody read First Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. See, now they say, see everybody's a lost and kind of Adam, everybody's going to be saved without Jesus. Because if you're going to say everybody's lost and kind of Adam, you've got to admit everybody's going to be saved in the kind of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's, those are parallel passages, but here's the way you've got to look at it in a way it, that is correct. Adam was the occasion. Now, most people don't even know what the word occasion means. Occasion means the circumstance. <clears throat> like, for instance, this man fell in the swimming pool because he was, the occasion was he's standing on the edge of the diving board and he's street clothes. Had no business there in the first place, right? So standing on the edge of the diving board was the occasion, which was stupid. And he got a little dizzy and fell in. Now the diving board didn't make him do that, did it? He just was where he didn't belong. Or how to act there with something going up and down like that. See? And you can get dizzy and fall in. Now the diving board was the occasion, but not the cause. It's the circumstance. All right, now, Adam was the circumstance through whom sin entered into the world, not the cause, because you cannot cause sin. You get that? Because mm -hmm. sin involves a choice, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, a choice always involves a choice to do it or not to do it. So how can it be caused? <coughs> See, as I've said to you people, and I hope you get this down deep in your heart, you never get the church and the people in the United States are so dumb now, they don't know the difference between a choice and a causation. Everything that man does is aberrations. Now what do I mean by aberrations? Do you know? What do I mean by an aberration? I guess I um, made the main choice or uh, uh, an aberration is doing something that departs from the norm. Like a guy wears his hat upside down. Yeah. And these guys who wear their hats backwards. Those are aberrations. Real think of people will think you're nuts if you do that. But the young guys think it's cute. No, it's stupid. <laughs> yeah. Nothing cute about it. It's stupid. All right, now that's an aberration. What do you wear backwards? Do you put your shoes on backwards? <laughs> do you put your pants on backwards? So what do they think is so funny and cute about putting a baseball cap on back? In the first place, they shouldn't be wearing it inside anyway. That shows a lack of being trained right, that you didn't come from a good family. If I'd ever worn a hat in the house to eat, my mother would have spanked the living daylights out of me, and I would have had it coming. But I was too smart to do that, and I love my mother. I wouldn't make my mother look bad by doing something stupid like that, and very, that's very, very uncouth. I hate to go in restaurants where men are sitting around baseball caps. 
How many of you know who Bear Bryant was? <laughs> well, I saw him in one of the last games, I mean on TV, in the Sugar Bowl. Mm -hmm. Down in, well, Bear Bryant had a plaid hat, if you remember, a black and white stripes. And they said to him, Mr. Bryant, this is the first time we ever saw you coach football, you didn't have your plaid hat on. He said, I'm indoors, and my mother raised me right to take my hat off when I go indoors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he gave the whole country a lesson in etiquette right there. Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Now, if anybody ought to have good manners, it's Christian people. And not try to act like the no good bums that go around looking who want to look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Get my point? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, aberrations are anything that departs from the norm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, so that you don't look ridiculous. You don't look like you're, like you're one of the brainless idiots that go around squirting stuff on walls and stuff like that, see? Mm -hmm. Now, Christians, let me tell you something about Christians. He says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a peculiar people. Now that word peculiar, come in. There's a place where you sit down over here. Brother Harry, you know Paul from that. Yeah, I sure do. And uh no, best you Paul. I'm a real good friend of mine, Bob Bear. Hi, Bob. Hi, Tom. Nice to meet you. Sit down, we're just gonna open the keg of nails here. <laughs> <laughs> You had heard that before, have you? Yeah. <laughs> Where was I? Aberration. the king of man. Aberration. <laughs> Etiquette. No. Original but... sin. What? Causation between difference between causation and choice. Yes. I'm saying the whole American public is going stupid. The psychologists, even the theologians, the sociologists. Now here's the Supreme Court judge that we had. Thank goodness he retired. Because I always thought he played too much football with his helmet off. <laughs> <laughs> he says his statement in an address he gave, and he probably gave it 50, 75 times. He got $3,500 for giving. And he would say, when a man kills his wife and four children, we should not blame him for what he has done, but look into what caused him to do it. Now, there could not be a more stupid statement if he said all the rest of his life to try to write one more stupid than that. Now, you dear friends, since you've had some study, tell me what's wrong with that statement. And when I'm teaching in a school, I'll tell you, I said, most of you don't even know what's wrong with it, but by the time I finish in two weeks, you ought to be able to sit down and write 2,000 words. But how stupid that statement. That is if the Spirit of God dwells within you. Because you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. That word peculiar doesn't mean odd. You go around the black hat on like that. <laughs> And you zip it on the side if you're a young man. <laughs> that word there means a peculiar. That means you're you have the spirit of God in you, and you're unusual. You're outstanding. You're not the norm. I tell you, I can lecture in a college. You give me three hundred students. This old thing is, well, you can't teach over 20, for goodness sake, what kind of teachers are they? I said, the woman here said, you can't teach 24? I had a woman named Sadie Keever, she taught 34 of us how to read. But you women can't teach it because you're walking the halls half the time, drinking coffee and showing three movies a day. You call that teaching. You teach her the highest paid people in the whole world. You make about $500 an hour for one year teaching. <laughs> well, isn't that right? So, what's wrong with this statement? When a man kills his wife and four children, we'll look into what caused him to do it. 
Well, cause has to do with physical action, not moral action. Now, see this thing here? I think that's a light, isn't it? Yeah, it's a candle. All right, now let's say that that's a Bunsen burner we got out of a high school laboratory. And I put up here over it, I put a retort with water in it. And I get this lit. Now what's going to happen to the water? Now tell me. At a certain temperature, at a certain altitude. Right? See? Don't give me those one word answers. <laughs> I want you to do a little thinking, see? You've got to realize 5% of the people think, 5% think they think. The other 90% would rather die than think. Now, you've got a son. You've got to be a thinker if you're ever going to do anything. It's thinkers that change the world, not feelers. You get what I'm saying? All right, now, we get it lit, and it begins to rise in temp uh, temperature. And if we have a retort like this, it'll come here and condense and come back in. But if we don't, now, let me ask you. That water, does it have any freedom as to whether it's going to boil or not? No. No. All right. The cause is the heat. The effect is the boiling. That's a physical action. You cannot cause moral action. Now, I'm going to give you a good example of this in the Bible. I was lecturing over in Aberdeen, Scotland. When I finished it, my, these people I'm staying with, see, my daddy was a Scotsman. He came, he, my forefathers came tearing out of there before the war of the re revolution, which doesn't make me a blue blood. <laughs> my dad used to warn us about saying you're blue bloods because so was Sir Francis Drake. And Walter Riley and the biggest thieves in Scotland. <laughs> you know, they're, they're made to serve because they stole more horses than anyone else and gave them to the King of Scotland. <laughs> Every one of those guys over there got it in the dubious ways like that. So if you ever, ever brag about being a blue bud, you're, you're really the other end of the spectrum when you're so dumb you don't know it. <laughs> it's like about bragging like being from Australia. They took all their criminals in England and put them over in Australia. So it didn't come from too good a stuff. All right, now, that is a physical action. With the physical action, there's, is there anything right or wrong with the water boiling? No, nothing wrong. Because it's a physical action, is this the cause, that's the effect. All right, now then, when we get down to this a little bit uh, closer, I can say to you that all the 92 or more elements, and my synthetic elements, up around 110, 15 now, they all obey the law of cause and effect. Now, I often ask people, after I've been teaching moral government for a while, I say to them, why, now God governs the sun, the moon, the stars, this earth. Yes, and our body obeys it too. The law of cause and effect. He can produce a cause and effect. A cause and effect will happen every time with him. Now with us, it's not quite every time because there's so many variables. Now, we can't handle the variables, but he can. In fact, is that's how they happen to come up with nuclear science anyway. It's called the indeterminacy principle, if you understand that. So I don't want you going around saying that it's always cause and effect, because maybe the five, five billions at one time, it doesn't happen. Because these variables didn't line up the same way all the time. But ordinarily, yes. But what I'm trying to say with God's cause and effect, there's no variables. <laughs> <laughs> there's no probabilities. It's going to happen. Now, with our cause and effect, yes, there may be some variables. All right, so when I'm finished teaching there, 
they take me way up in northern Scotland. My forefathers came tearing out of that northern Scotland up there in County Roslyn. That ground is so poor that when a rabbit goes across there, he carries his own lunch. I, no wonder they like it. <laughs> Solid rock and a few sheep riders snibble around and get hold. So they take me to this farm. There's two brothers, about 55, 60 years old. Now, they weren't retarded, but they sure were slow on the uptake, if you know what I mean. I'm not saying that to make fun of them. This woman and her husband, who took me there, were relatives, and their dad had been immensely wealthy, and he had a brother that was a big preacher. So her this dad is dead, so they put this farm there, and these two guys have got a great big job of raising 150 chickens. That's all. But it keeps them busy and keeps them out of trouble, out of town, and so forth. And they're telling them that I've been teaching the theology. Oh, you have. Did you ever hear of our uncle, the great preacher? Well, I have to admit I didn't. Because it's so Calvinistic over there, I never knew of a great theologian coming out of there. I'll say that guy right there, George McDonald. Well, they said, he he's, uh, said, no. Nah. When they built this house for us, they built this library here, and they brought all his books over here. And they're in here, and when a scholar comes here to visit us, we say, well. You can go in the library and we'll give you one book. You get the choice of all of them in there. And you can go in there. I thought, let's cut out the small talk. I don't want to get in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love to be around old books, good the theological books. Mm -hmm. Well, after a half hour, I figured, man, about 800 guys beat me there. Because <laughs> 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 I didn't see anything there. I didn't, I'd be even willing to cart home and my wife. I drive her nuts with books anyway. I got about three thousand in my basement, and I got three, three of my, I mean, three libraries upstairs. And she says, books, 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 books. And just but, but I say I live here too. <laughs> but I use a lot of those in my work. A lot of them, are at least about a thousand of them, are books on science. And I say, honey, this is what I make my living. You eat off of these books. Make fun of them if you want to, but. That's why we eat regular. <laughs> well, so I just keep on looking around. And I used to have a Swedish theologian friend. His name is Gustav Feuer. And he worked at old, he, with old Greek manuscripts and a Texas Receptus. Not that he had a copy himself. That's who most people in the research of the King James, that's what they use. One day he said to me, Brother Harry, he couldn't say brothers, brother. And he said, Brother Harry, if you give me a Bible, you take and paste in a piece of paper, or tear out the page, which tells you what version it is. So I can't see it. Give it to me one hour and I'll tell you what their theology was that translated it by what they do with various passages. Because the big problem with, with translation is not they don't know Greek. Of course, none of us know it the way we should because we've got a couple thousand years in between. But he says, you give it to me for one hour, and I'll tell you what their theology was by the translation, by what they do with certain passages. So I'm standing there, and I look at a new Greek interlinary. And so I said, that's what I want. So I take this thing out. Now I start going through it to look at various passages and see if I can figure out their theology. Well, the first thing I do, you know, ten times in the Bible says Jesus Christ slain from before the foundation of the world, which is a horrendous, terrible translation. It should be Jesus Christ slain because of the moral disintegration of the world. That was the Calvinists bringing their ideas of foreknowledge in there. 
And they change it like that in 10 places. It should be Jesus Christ slain because of the moral disintegration of the world. Well, I looked at those. No, that same old way. I said, well, it's just not as good as it ought to be. I don't know who it is. Then I went to one of my favorites. Now, would you please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5, 32. Someone please read it for us. <clears throat> but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. See, makes her. Makes her, but wait a minute. What does yours say? Cause it? No, I just think that. Well, mine says cause it. Yeah. King James says cause it. Yours say cause it? Yeah. What translation you got here? King James. Who's got the authorized reverse vision here? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yours says makes. Well, even a eight year old girl knows a girl been raped is not sinning, she's been forced. Well, makes there is still his force. And I looked in this Bible, and I, this new interlinary, and it has makes her a subject of adultery. Now that's the way it ought to be, because there's an either or, a may or may not. But in causation, there's no either or, may or may not. It's going to happen, right? By the way, I later found several Bibles that have it that way. I was teaching out in California, and there's a guy that I used to know here in Henry something, a, a Puerto Rican lad. You guys, uh, yeah. you know who I mean? Yeah. 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 And he was interpreting, but not up there beside me. He's interpreting for his Brazilian students against the wall. And when I went into this, because I'm really going after causation, the difference between influence and causation. And our whole modern deal is built on that terrible mistake. And because I say to those guys, wait a minute, slums don't make crimes, crimes make slums. Well, no matter how right I am or anyone else, you're never going to get to sociologists to believe that, because if you do, they're out of a job. They want to be honest, but not that honest. <laughs> oh. And I know them so well. Just like Pavlov, in his experiments, in his scientific papers, he said, many dogs resisted conditioning. I could not condition them. I'll give you a thousand dollars if you'll get find a professor to tell you that that teaches psychology or behaviorism because it's all built on that. Mm -hmm. But they don't tell you that he couldn't condition every dog. But I can tell you the books and where where that is. You can go and document what I'm saying. Now I turn this book around because it makes her subject of and by the way, I started telling you about being teaching in California, and Henry was sitting over against the wall with these, and they began to make noise over there like somebody scored a touchdown. Well, that's kind of unnerving me a little bit, and, and it's kind of hurting my trend of thought. I said, Henry, let us in on it. I wasn't mad. I said, Henry, he said, Brother Harry, this Portuguese Bible's got it just the way you say, makes her a subject of. Adultery. I said, well, that's exactly right. That's the way it ought to be. Because you can't make, make a woman commit adultery and have her guilty, can you? Mm -hmm. No, nah, she's forced. And in every sin, there has to be free will to do it or not to do it. Well, that's influencing. See, I can say no to good influence. I can say yes to good influence. Now here I am. I had a godly mother as any man could ever have. When she went to glory, half of the earth of our kids were saved. The other half weren't because my daddy wasn't a Christian. 
Now, these other brothers and sisters that weren't Christians, they were raised under the same influence that I was. Well, they didn't want Mama's religion. I said, I want Mama's Christ. I want Mama's religion. Boy, she loves the poor, the sick, the lame, and the lazy. <laughs> And I want what Mama's got. I never heard an intelligent preach in New York City. And man, Demosthenes, he couldn't find one there. You know, he's a guy that went around with a lantern, you know, in the daytime looking for an honest man. It was, it, it was, a, it was all cheap, grace, and easy, believe it. You couldn't get... Uh, anyway, my point is to this. makes her a subject of adultery. Now, he puts her in this circumstance. But the circumstance is only an occasion. It's not a cause. Now, we got in there, we started in, on this verse now, which says, Adam, well, who will read it for us? 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Oh. <clears throat> so as in Adam all die, so as in Christ all be made alive. Well, Brother, would you read it for us? Sure. <clears throat> for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. All right, if you're going to say everybody's lost in kind of Adam, you've got to say everybody's going to be saved in kind of Jesus. And that's where that's silly. Universalism. Universalism came up, and Hannah Whitehall Smith, she swallowed it, and she boogered up a lot of preachers like Gypsy Smith and others, because they let her. Well, they didn't know the difference between a causation and an influence, but you cannot study Finney without knowing the difference. And that's what made the guy so great. He gave us no reason for sin. None. He said a preacher's job and if you're going to be a preacher or a missionary, your job is to take sides with God against sin. And it's, your job is to go around and tear all the sinner's hiding places down. Where the preachers, they build them enough hiding places for <laughs> Miami Beach. <laughs> well, you know, Romans 7, you know, things I would or things I would not, you know. <laughs> well, if you take, if you know what even the Calvinists taught in the last previous centuries, that Paul was writing in retrospect there in Romans 7, 13 through 24, how he's under conviction but not converted. That's not Christian experience. But yet when I go out and I begin to preach and God's Spirit begins to convict of sin, I say, well, Brother Harry, uh, uh, what do you think? I'm still in Romans 7. I said, you better get to Romans 8, buddy. You haven't been converted. <laughs> <laughs> Because therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Amen. who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And some of these new translations have taken that last part out. Mm -hmm. And I heard a former pastor of mine preaching up here at Camp of the Woods, where I was speaking this past summer. And he's speaking to 1,800 people, but he had a new translation there that takes that out. But... And he preached those first four verses, but he never read because that's moved down to the fourth verse. But he didn't put it in there. Who walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's dishonest. Dishonest. So, I'm in Washington. I think the year was 19... Uh, Seventy-eight Jimmy Carter's in the White House. Well, they had seventy-five Christian leaders there, and I don't know why they invited me. Where to go to the White House to meet Jimmy Carter? Well, I wouldn't jump over that table to meet Jimmy Carter. I'll tell you why. I had a friend in California that when he was running around trying to get the nomination, this in seventy-five. He spoke perhaps 50 times in Los Angeles area, Rotary clubs, all kinds of clubs. I will rise and shine on Tuesday morning, you know. And these newspaper men were following. And they went up to him 
And these are sent to me in clippings. I said to him, you say that you will work to legalize homosexuality, and yet you say you're a born-again Christian. How do you square that? Here's what his answer was. Well, I never mix my religion with my politics. He sure didn't. He didn't have enough to mix. You wouldn't have found it in there anyway if you did mix it. <laughs> well, you think I've, I've said something very, very harsh? Said, oh, no, not when you know about it, what I know about it. Now, well, they asked me to go back to White House. I was no more interested in going to the White House than you are to the Milwaukee Zoo. So I'm praying that morning. I seem to get an indication or an impression. I say, I seem. The Lord seemed to indicate to me, he wanted me to go see our brother Paris Reed. Great preacher. I called him up. I said, Paris, this is Harry Conn. Where are you? I said, I'm over here to Mayflower. Or, yeah, Mayflower. Man, you're only three blocks from out. Would he come over? I need to see. Well, I got over there and he was so far down the dumps he could have found me an old tire. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. And they'd been pounding on him. And I told him what he meant to me, and so on and so forth. We had a great time, and I took him to lunch. We went over to Sheraton, a real nice, sedate kind of a place to eat. And we're all sitting around and whispers. So I tell him about this, about this thing here. I said, Paris, we're friend, but that doesn't give me the right to let you get away with teaching something that's terrible. And you talked about, and you bring that out from the Old Testament, where I'm going to cause you to go into the promised land, and you're, you're, I'm going to cause you to do this, I'm going to cause you to do that. And I said, but that's during the time of the millenniums. And there isn't time for, see, it took God about 5,000 years for people to get enough knowledge to put it all together and give us a Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, 1,000 years ain't going to give enough time during that time. And so, some of those Jews, he's going to do that to them, but that's not God's ordinary way of doing business. And I pointed that out to him. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Because I said, you cannot cause a man to sin. You can influence him to sin, but he can say no or he can say yes. And he's rewardable for the good, and he's condemnable for the bad. But if he's caused, it's neither. Because his will is not free in this. And God looks not only on what we do, but what was our intention of the heart behind it. That's what he rewards. Not so much what we do, why? And I said, no, and I went into this thing here, and I showed him that this word power. And he said, boy, oh, that's wonderful, Brother Harry. And I, I realized I've been wrong in this thing. He says, what translation was this? I'm going to tell you, but you better hold it. Better hold your nose. Hold, hold the phone, boy. When I tell you who, you won't believe it. He said, who was it? I said, the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> they got it right. Oh, they got it right, and all these others. But I said, the Portuguese they got it right, and there's one or two others. <laughs> We got to laughing about how stupid we were. We almost fell on the floor out there. I mean, to tell you, how in the world could we ever miss something? You know. Well, when you see my slides on moral government, I say we make terrible mistakes in our teaching by the theologians, by the psychologists, by the psychiatrists, and I go ahead and name the professional people that don't know the difference between an influence and a causation. And here's our Supreme Court Justice making that stupid statement. Then you wonder why the country is going down the tubes. Every preacher should know that, shouldn't he, what we've been talking about here. And you go down there and say, hey, you guys, 
These, you're spending all this money because you're going to remake the new neighborhoods and you think you're going to make a new man. No, no, no. That's just like if you put a pig in the house, it's going to get a pig pen. Now, nah. so I said, now nah, I'll prove it to you, people. That his slums are made by crimes and by sin. And here's a man. He's married to a woman. Got five or six kids. He doesn't have any particular skill, but he's not afraid to work, and he works, and she works. And they just keep their nose a little bit above the economic level, and living in just a decent house, nothing to brag about, but it's nothing to be ashamed of either. So they're getting a spat one night, just a spat. But then he acts like a runny-nosed baby, and he runs down to Corner Tavern or maybe a little further, and sits on the stool, and the local strumpet comes up and whispers in his ear that his wife doesn't appreciate him, and he's a sweet guy, and she knows it, and about 15 minutes, they're in bed. Well, about three weeks, he wakes up, and he's hurting. He's got a venereal disease. Well, during that time, about that time, he's had intercourse with his wife, and she's got it. Oh, she knows I haven't been running around. That can only come from one place. That's from him. So she sues him for divorce, and I think she's got a right to it, according to this Bible. And now they split up. Now I ask you, now they split up. Now they got to have two places to live, one for him, one for her. Are they two better places or two down? where they don't really care, never lost to zest for life, don't even mow the yard, they don't do this, and go. they don't paint, and they, you know what I mean? I mean, it moves into the slums practically. If it isn't, it will be, very shortly. Now, are you going to tell me that those slums caused those people to be like that? Or did sin cause all this? No. My daughter is going to Baptist college. I didn't say a Christian college because Jesus doesn't save colleges. Some of them are a little bit more Christian than others. I'm not picking on the Baptists here. But I also didn't pick the colleges where they went, my kids. But I also told them where they couldn't go. <laughs> and one of them is the best known Christian college you know of in this country, and I said, you're not going there because I've known two or three hundred of, of those graduates, and every one of them but three are snobs, and I'm not going to pay $40,000 for you to become a snob. You would sit still. I can make one out of you for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to that so-called Christian college where they're better than everyone else. I've been on mission fields where these graduates are there, wouldn't even associate with the other missionaries that hadn't graduated from there. I'm going to not tell you which one. So my daughter goes up, up to this school that she picked up. Not that one. No, I would not let him, my kids go to that college. And so, this guy in psychology gives a lecture on an old circuit that's been around since 1895, that you can put a man in a test tube and you can predict what he'll do, as if there's no incipiency of the will. You see what I mean? And he gave that old silly that's been around so long, never was true. When he finished, he said, now, does anybody here have any remarks they'd like to make? Now, my daughter, Faithy, you're going to meet her. Brother, she's the finest woman speaker in the country, but she's as gentle as a lamb, and she's, she is, point I'm trying to think of, She's so sensitive to the Lord. She's so shy, you'd never think she's my daughter. <laughs> but she's shy, but when she gets by in the pulpit, I say, you only preach to women, no men. <laughs> she said, I know, Daddy, I know the word. <laughs> 
boy, oh boy, they say this was the greatest woman in the whole country. And when it comes to preaching the gospel, but only to women. Now, he said, now any of you children, now I know no theology that I haven't taught to my kids. I'd be sinning if I did. Boy, my daughters and my son don't think that. You can't give them any Calvinistic horse ready. Because <laughs> they know him like the back of their hand. The old man read eight biographies, and I taught seven winners in, in Switzerland. So I think I know something about him from rooting around over there. And how he and, he and uh, Martin Luther drowned 1,080 Baptists in Lake Lemon for no other reason, and they disagreed with him. That's not the way people with truth act. John Calvin and Martin Luther. Martin Luther wrote the first anti-Semitic books, and they're still on sale over there. And when they had the generals on the Nuremberg trials for atrocities on the stand, they said, I shouldn't be here on the stand. Our prosecuting attorneys from here say, why shouldn't you be here? Well, I got this all from reading Martin Luther's anti-Semitic books. And Martin Luther said, if your wife won't go to bed with you, take the maid. Now here's a guy who helped drown a thousand eighty. He makes statements like that. You want to follow him? Not me. Not me. So my daughter, she stands up. She said, Professor, that's an old lecture, that one you gave. My, that thing's got whiskers on it. <laughs> I heard that, I heard that so long ago from my dad to show us what's wrong with it. You seem to never have heard of the incipiency of the will. He said, that's right, Miss Connor. I did. What is it? Well, she said, man being made in the image of God, part of that image is that God's put a free will within us. And by incipiency, we mean the origination of, that man has a mysterious ability to originate his own actions apart from any outside or inside influence. He can be raised godly and go throw it away when he gets away from home. And the parents didn't fail. That was one of the greatest mysteries of our endowment. Or they can be raised in a lousy family and be sick and tired. And when they get away from home, they want to go find a good gospel church and get right with God. And they do it. But it isn't God causing either one. Because you can say no to an influence or you can say yes. But you've got us in a test tube. You're saying that you can predict what man will do. No, no, no. You don't even know modern psychology because they'll say if there are 500 people and you predict what, there will be one or two won't. <laughs> one or two, and you can't predict which ones either. Now, you ought to know that. He said, Miss Kahn, when this class is dismissed, I'd like to, for you to come and see me. And she's just getting started. <laughs> and she's about to blow that guy away. He ought to be teaching the third grade down in the slums, not in a college where you got to pay decent money. Afterwards, she walks up to him and said, you said you, I must talk to you. He takes her to the head of the department, told him what she said. He said, Miss Kahn, if you will not think that thing of causation and influence and different. If you will not take that out of your mind and out of your life, we will not let you get a degree here in the subject in which you're on. She said, I, my daddy teaches theology, and I want you to know I believe that with all of my heart, and I also believe it from my work around, which I've worked every summer in places. I've seen people get up to all kinds of truth and tremble and shake but trust in Christ and then back off. Any practical soul winner that's ever done much has had one or two that got that close and backed off because they see the cost was too high and they wanted to live it up. See, in the kingdom of God, friends, there's no shotgun marriages. <laughs> no such thing as irresistible grace. Only the Calvinists got that stupid. Or effectual calling. I told you about speaking to this ministerial association. They wanted me to speak to them on a layman evaluates a ministry poll. 
He called me a day or two before. Are you going to speak on that subject? I said, no, no, no. Well, you agreed to, but five months ago, I said, I know I did. I didn't have all my sense with me that day. <laughs> oh, well, why won't you speak on it? I said, well, to be frank, I don't want to imitate Stephen. <laughs> Quite yet. What do you mean about being stoned to death? I said, yeah, you asked me to evaluate the ministry? If I, if I give you my evaluation, you'd throw me out of the place. So I'm going to speak on, really, what has to happen at a conversion experience. And if it doesn't, they're never converted. We got all these cheap grace and easy believism and four spiritual laws and four things God wants you to know, which have no repentance in them, have hardly any light in them, and they're as false as a $3 bill. So I think it's more important that I teach you guys what a true Christian experience is. And dear brother Gordon Olson is the only man in this whole country that ever made a real in-depth study of what has to happen. And he got much of it from Finney, I admit, and Finney to me is wonderful. Well, I gave that to these pastors. Oh boy, when I finished Paul, you didn't need to open the door. They could have crawled out of the crack. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give me any jawbone either. And I said, you got any coach or not? We got to take them. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I've got to take your pistol. Another one who went out there, you think it was at a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get out to my car. I'm going back to work. My brother, who had a degree from Southwestern Baptist Seminary, the best seminary that the Southern Baptists have in Fort Worth. And this guy's a good brother. He came up to me and he said, Brother Harry, don't you believe salvation's all of God? I said, no, I don't. He looked at me and said, how'd this liberal get in here? But then he thought, hey, that didn't come out of any liberal, but I just heard in there he scared me half to death. Well, I said, well, I'm brother, Jerry, let me ask you if I don't understand the question, but I do or not. What you're asking me, don't I believe in a flexible calling? Or is irresistible grace taught by the Calvinists that God can save anybody, anywhere, any time in this galaxy and this earth, anyone, anywhere, any time that he chooses, by irresistible grace, by a mother praying and weeping over him, somebody handing him a tract, and a preacher for four Sundays in a row dangling over hell, that now he just takes in by irresistible grace, or effects of calling. That's what you're asking me, isn't it? That God can save anybody, anywhere, anytime he chooses? He said, yes. I said, no, I don't believe that. I'm going to tell you why. Seven times in my Bible, he says, I know respect a person. And I'm not willing that any should perish. Now, I'm a little one long layman preaching a couple hundred times a year when in a precious few, but your great God can save anybody and everybody if he wants to at any place, any time, but he's not. Now, if I'm trying hard, doing everything I know to win souls and win in a precious few because I can't overpower the will, and I'm winning a precious few, and your great God can save everybody anywhere, anytime he chooses, then he, and he's not, then he doesn't love sinners as much as I do. Well, we all know that can't be right. You know what he said? He says, wow, oh, like I'd hit him in the head with a board. <laughs> a guy who think that through can't be a Calvinist. If you think that through, with the various ramifications of that. Well, what I believe in theology is not popular. It's not popular. So he has stayed the popular way. And today the guy's like this. I mean, literally, he's like this. He, if he takes a drink of water, he spoils it all, spills it all over himself. 
I have prayed for people, and God, has, I told you, I prayed for nine people dying of cancer. God healed seven of them. That's pretty good back in the average compared to Oral Roberts point old ninety one. <laughs> but the thing about it is, I know this about God. He never does anything arbitrarily. Never. He never has. And he never will. Because that would be sin. And he teaches me not to do anything arbitrarily, intentionally. Not to say I've done that thing arbitrarily, but I did it out of ignorance. But never intentionally. So, when I was a Baptist, they used to say, they thought they'd be an intellectual in saying this. You people have got to get a hold of this. They'd say, how do you reconcile the free will of man with the sovereignty of God. They think, oh, that's a great intellectual statement to which there's no answer. I say, that's no problem at all. That's a matter of understanding sovereignty and the very word. Now, here we are, gentlemen. We are in the sovereign state of New Jersey. Now, what that means is, being a member of the United States and under the Constitution framework, that you have the ability to make your own laws, your own rules and regulations, regardless how they affect any other state, but within the framework and limitations of the corp of the Constitution. It's not an unlimited sovereignty. Now, my great God, He's sovereign. That simply means a governor. That's what's so fancy about the word sovereignty we should be afraid of. He's a moral governor. The word kingdom of God is form of moral government, not physical government, moral government. So, what is so great about it? Well, I tell you, our great God will not go against this book. Will he? Never. He won't go against that wonderful nature of his. He won't go against his holy character. And he won't do anything arbitrarily. So, my friend, what is there to reconcile with free will? This doesn't contradict this, and he doesn't contradict that. That's just being straight on the truth. So it's not so it's not so intellectual after all. That just comes from loving the blessed Lord Jesus with all our heart. And making this book a part of us and obeying what little we know. Because if we are not willing to obey what little we know now, and by the way, all through our life we can say well, what little, because we'll never have enough knowledge to be proud about it. And if we're not willing to obey what little we know now, the blessed Holy Spirit of God will not give us any more knowledge or enlightenment. See, that's a revelation, but to know what it means, that's enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That takes the Holy Spirit of God. And as I said last night, he resists at the proud, but he giveth grace and enlightenment to the lowly. I sat with one of the biggest preachers, three biggest preachers in the world, two years ago, and he's telling me, well, it'd be good if they could all go to Oxford and they could all do this. I said, no, no, it wouldn't help a bit. Wouldn't help a bit. Why do you say that? Well, we got a probably a thousand of you guys running around the world now, and I don't see any of you turning it upside down. You haven't even seen revival. Because you do not realize the secret to knowing this blessed book is trust and obey, for there's no other way. I said, when I got saved in New York City, I started going to theological school that fall. Not to become a preacher, but I wanted to be well informed and please God, my, my fellow man. I was a chief of a big engineering firm in General Motors building. I wasn't looking for a job, not that I was too good to be a preacher, I didn't think that. So I take, the, I go over there to get to schooling. Well, I had to work at it. And when I stopped going there, I was worse, worse shape than I was before I went in. Because they taught me things. It's not like that. Then I went to another. It was terrible. And I, I heard a wonderful message on missions. It was on 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness 
and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. This good brother quoted that verse at least five times, and every time he stuck his finger out there like that, see, he put it on the end of my nose. And he was saying, Harry Khan, it's your shame. The 2,000 people died today and went off into Christless eternity and never heard the gospel. It's your shame. Now you're going to be like these women with their naked bodies on paper, on magazines? That's people with no shame. And Christians that aren't moved, aren't moved by 2,000 people going into hell every day without hearing the blessed gospel. If that doesn't bother you, then you're dead. Well, I began to give all my money to missions and to the poor and the sick. Well, I said, I've been to these schools, and I'm telling this to this big preacher, you'd all know the name. And I said, I'm getting this stuff, and I go home, and I'm trying to straighten my dear mother out. Some of the things she was taught in her church. She looked at me very sweet, and he said, son, no, that's not the way it is. She'd walk away to an argument. Well, 12 years later, I get under the finest theologian in this world. After praying and after preaching, teaching 900 missionaries every day and 1,600 of them to go in Japan, God showed me over there I didn't know what I was talking about, and they didn't either. Now, here's the top man in the country. They called him the Fuller of Japan. He was a graduate of Fuller Seminary, and he had a little radio network. I knew Fuller. I spoke and talked in Fuller Cemetery there in Pasadena. And he heard me lecture in this school, and he takes me to his home, this guy in the Fuller of Japan. He's got a radio network. We sat there on the floor that night with our feet down the hole, very cold up in the mountains. His mother said, he said, Brother Khan, I want to tell you what's wrong with the church here in Japan. He said, the gospel has been here 99 years with the exception of World War II. And all the believers, the dog and cat divisions of <laughs> Protestantism, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christian Scientists, the Evangelical Free Church, the Baptists. And he, he said, put them all to, and the Catholics, put them all together to 80,000. Now, when in almost 91 million there, and Brother Paul, something only works eight-tenths of one percent of the time, being an engineer and a scientist, when it doesn't work, we don't stand there and holler at the machine, <laughs> like the preachers do. No, we go back into our calculations and our principles under which we designed this to find out what was wrong. No, we say, oh, it's a lady to see an age. You can't help it all. They never dreamed on it. The lady to see an age is caused by lady to see in preachings. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> ah, and I said to him, after I get under this great scholar, I'm under him about a year and a half. Oh, bless God. The first two messages, he had me in the first grade. It was like a man stepping on a grape. And I was a grape. <laughs> he took all my sermons away from me, except what I had on missions. That's all. I had my, here I preach in the biggest churches from coast to coast. I have a couple thousand converts a year, but I couldn't find them a year later. Like Billy Graham, he can only find 3%, and he needs a million from the rest to find them. Yet Charles Finney had 85% of them stick. There's something wrong, and it's a dynamite tap. Something wrong. So I go home to my mama. I said, Mama, I'm ashamed of myself. You're such a wonderful mother. And here I come home. 1946 and 47, you straight me out on your doctor. You give me a sweet grin and say, No, son, it's not the way you exactly that. You got your theology straight. I had mine backwards. Give them to me, please. Now I said to this so called one of the three greatest preachers in the country. 
You know what the difference between that dear godly mother of mine was and all you guys coming out of seminary? I'll tell you what it is. First, she's a very, very humble woman. My mother was the wife of a man who's the smartest man in the whole state, former symphony conductor, symphony musician, had this wonderful factory, and she got saved because my sister got killed. She had a broken heart. And I heard it in a storefront mission, if you will, please. And we went to the only church in town where the wealthy and upper nouters went. The poor weren't even, weren't even welcome there. But she went to a, she went forward that night and wept her way and prayed her way through and went home with the glory of God in her soul. My dad got killed Not once but many times. And they started to build a little stucco church. And in that time, if you, if you had a job and made any money, you worked for my dad. But they wouldn't take money from heathen. They'd make it themselves. My mother started taking in washings to help pay for that church. When they got it done, she supported a missionary full time above her tithe. Before that, we had big tea parties in our house. Women came in wearing house hats that looked like traps, you know, that thing like that. <laughs> but after Mama got saved and started witnessing to them, they treated her like she had leprosy. She went on serving the Lord. I'll tell you what the secret to it was. That dear woman loved the poor and the sick and the, and the lost, but she obeyed what little she knew. Mm. There was the answer. Mm. And you guys don't. Because I've been around enough of you. No, I don't want nothing to do with you so-called big shots. It's a wonder I'm a Christian after the way what I've seen. But no, I had a godly mother back there. I got saved in spite of that preacher in Carnegie Hall. Because I knew how a Christian ought to be because I saw one. I saw one. Now, I have brothers, and I got a brother in hell today. I'm afraid I got a sister there too. They had the same mom and daddy, had the same environment. They had this wonderful godly mother there. I just said yes, they said no. I don't know why they said no. They wanted to be big in academic circles. Yet I had better education than they did. I said, no, I'll be preaching my students. You go ahead. Go ahead. Not that I'm smarter than them. No, no, no. I only went to night school and the lights were bad. <laughs> <laughs> I see what I mean by causation and influencing saying no, no to a good Influencer, you can say yes, but you cannot be caused. The incipiency of the will. That dear daughter of mine, when that professor, up to that time, she wanted to become a lady theologian. Well, she wrote a paper on carnal Christian with a big question mark and quotes. She wrote the best research paper on it I've ever seen in my life. This return missionary, Baptist missionary, he writes and said, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. And he marked her that he gave her a D. I wanted to go up there and say, man, what are you doing teaching up here if you can't understand what your students are writing? What are you doing teaching? Now, if you're going to teach a dog, you got no more to dog. And I don't think you do. That's what I would have said to him. But she said, Daddy, by the way, I see this religious big shot. I don't want to be a lady theologian. <coughs> I'm going to be a good housewife. I'm going to raise kids for the Lord. My kids are going to know him too, Daddy. Now, I'm going to serve him the best way I know how, but I don't want to be a theologian when I see the way they act and all the machinations that they have. Because you read these, you read these theological journals. All these Seminary professor writing is to impress the other seminary professors. It's never to help the layman in the pew. It's never to help the preacher. It's to convince all those other guys on the same level how smart they are. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to sit down. Maybe you got a few questions here. Like that. that help you? You cannot cause a man to sin. You can influence him, maybe say no. Say, due to that wonderful word, the incipiency of the will.
That's the biggest mystery of man. That's, that's it. Wouldn't you wonder why? Jesus, the sinless Son of God, carpenter, and his own brothers, when he, after he'd been in the ministry one year and he goes home, they pay no attention to him. And it says, this is Luke 6, 6, or maybe sorry, 6. He says, he marveled at their unbelief. He marveled. Now, if it's all predestined, there's nothing to marvel about. But he marveled at what? The evidence. He lived a godly life, and Joseph had married. That's the best lineage since Adam and Eve. And he lived a godly life in front of them, and he marveled at their unbelief. I said, turn him down. Well, there's some reason for it. None of them valid. Because I believe when he worked as a carpenter, he never made a window to stop. <laughs> a door you couldn't open. Oh. And he gave nine hours work for eight hours pay. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, every Saturday he's sitting in that he's sitting in that synagogue and he's very early going through that big thing up there. And he wasn't chasing every woman in town. No, no, he's watching over Mary like a hand over chicks. No, here's a sinless son of God and his own brothers and sisters. That's like Finney says in his great chapter, in The Unity of Moral Action, he said, I want to tell you something, friends, it's, it's possible for you to live a holy life and the preachers and the Christians around you not know it and make fun of you. Because here was Jesus, who lived an absolute holy life those religious leaders never even realized and recognized them. Now I'm going to close with this. From the time Jesus came on the scene until now, and I believe Jesus had revival in the true sense of the word. I don't mean the citywide campaign, all this uh, public relations forced draft. <laughs> From the time Jesus came on the scene, until right now. And we're about a hundred years now since we've seen the Holy Ghost revival in this country. Until now. Every revival, a Holy Ghost revival, has been led by man crying out against the air of the, of the orthodoxy of his day. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. But the leaders today of orthodoxy don't have a clue. Mm. And there's at least three of you guys in this room right now. I believe you can sit down there, out there in the afternoon and come up with a dozen things that the orthodoxy, the leaders of it today don't even know, such as there is no such thing as imputed righteousness because Jesus obeyed the law. There's imputed righteousness, but it has to be by reality, not by technicality. And I believe that you guys can give them the reasons for that. But yet, most of them have never heard what I just said. They've taken the easiest thing and they went along with that because you don't make anybody mad. And they say, God looks down from heaven and he doesn't see me and my sin. He sees the blood of Jesus and he, he puts that down to my credit. That is called legal fiction <laughs> by real good theologians of the last and previous centuries. Legal fiction, because look, man was required to love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Not even Jesus could love God with more than all his heart. So when he died on Calvary, he was a substitute sufferer. But it was not a substitute of obedience for you and me, because Jesus could not do more than love God with all his heart, so he had nothing left over to put down to my credit. Mm -hmm. But he says, what I'll do, I'll give myself to you by my spirit, and so you can live and think and act like me, and then you'll literally be righteous. Not a technicality that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the only kind of... Now, there's just one. I've just picked out one that the churches, the preachers know nothing about because they don't go back and really study. They don't have the guns over the hill what we used to preach when we had great revival. They have no idea. And if they do read it, they'll tell you what was all wrong with it. Mm. And yet those guys, 
Most of them ha don't have a conversion every two years. But they know what's wrong with what Finney preached. Baloney, they don't even understand him. Hmm. I've given them copies, I, because I don't know whether you know it, Paul, but I edited Finney's Systematic Theology in 76 edition, 1977. I can give that to these preachers nowadays. They can read that first page ten times and don't know a word to say. <laughs> Because they don't have disciplined minds to think. And now they're running around to preachers' meetings all the time and said, as F.B. Meyer says, get along with God 20, 22 hours a week to get a message for your people and you won't have to counsel them during the week. So, would you dismiss it, brother, before I have a stroke? <laughs> Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for your presence, Lord. Lord, we give you thanks for the effort you take to, to teach us, Lord, and make us understand your purpose, Lord, your great character, who we are, Lord, and who we can be, Lord, in right relationship with you. And Lord, then you go after the payment theory. Nowhere in the world can you find a revival where they believe Jesus paid for sin. That's Roman Catholic. You believe that? You're Roman Catholic, whether you know it or not. And I've run 394,000 miles to get away from being a Roman Catholic. <laughs> but yet, the church has no idea of the great stuff that's been written and what we have and as a background. Brother Olson, bless God, he gave his life for that. I would have been stupid. And God dropped him on top of me after me praying six weeks to not avail myself of that God the man's life who had spent 11 months at Oberlin College among Mr. Finney's facts. Quota statted. You see, fellas, in 1846 in the United States, we had 646 church-related colleges. Not 10 colleges of any importance that weren't church-related. Well, in 1858, over here comes the origin of species, evolution. Then, 1862, Mr. Lincoln, nothing wrong with it, he signed the Morrell Act, which gave us a land grant college. Where do you think they got their professors? In one place they could, from the Christian colleges. But during this particular time I'm talking about, we started down the tube caused by the Greek letter societies in college. You know what I mean by that? The sororities and the fraternities. Because mm -hmm. those 646 church-related colleges never believed because they sent their kid to a Christian college. That made a Christian out. You could put a baseball suit on a man, put him in Cubs Park, and won't make a ball player out of it. If you don't believe it, go watch the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> or the Phillies. You know what? Whoa, now, you begin, you get in, you begin to look at it like that. It's not such rosy, rosy glass. And it's up to us. Would you believe I can go to an ordinary Bible college? And I say, I only come for two weeks. There's nobody in here better, better give an invitation. While I'm doing it, I'll get up and walk right out of the place. Because most of your invitations, the guys come in and say, oh, no, wait, no, give me an invitation. Get him forward. Well, that's like taking a seven-year-old boy and marrying a five-year-old girl. I wonder why it doesn't last. Because he doesn't know what the obligations are. When you become a Christian, you're to count the cost. There's tremendous. Well, who preaches the cost? Who? No, it's just exact. That's not the premise of the Bible. The premise is there's three things. A man ever gets converted. First, he's got to be awakened. That's why I love natural law. <laughs> then he must be enlightened. It's what God's trying to do with people. He's not trying to get a bunch of unrepentant rebels to agree to go to heaven either. Then, after he's got that, tell them to seek the Lord with all their heart. If you don't know about it, go out in a cornfield, a field, or get away from people, get down on your knees and seek the Lord. And if he doesn't come down there and meet you, it's because you're holding on to some sin. And I've had done that with guys, educators, that have done it and been gloriously converted. 
But boy, you can talk all you want about it, except Jesus. You won't, because that's not the premise of the Bible. Hmm. Now, of course, you've got to accept Jesus. But the real big problem is to be so serious and count the cost and be willing to give him supreme place in our, in our life and our affection for him to do what seems right with him. But God, save me and transform me by your grace. See, the real atonement when preached right is not just for the penalty of sin, it's for the power of sin. You don't even hear that. I was 45 years old before I heard it, something decent on the atonement. No, I got that old stupid payment theory that an eight-year-old boy could preach. But not the one I'm talking about, because you've got to know God. And he has to make it real to you by His Spirit to do it. And I tell you, we could have revival today if people wanted it bad enough. Because mm -hmm. I've gone to places. I've seen 450 guys in a nice denominational school out of 500 down on their knees getting saved mm -hmm. from evangelical churches. Winky Prattney and I went. I went the first two weeks. He took the second. I didn't get any invitation. And Winky, they don't know enough to be saved. They're not serious enough. He took them the second two weeks, gave an invitation last day, and 920 of them stood up, said, we want to get right with God. He said, sit down. I don't think you understood me. And he goes through it again. <laughs> 920 got up again. And he really led them to the Lord. You could do that in almost every Bible college in this country and seminary. Mm. Now, if I can do that by the grace of God, why can't other men that care? I can't get in them anymore because it's going out. This guy, man, a lot, he's going to come in here. You can burn your place down if you don't look out. He doesn't have a match. <laughs> if they're not putting fourth real man of God, we might as well burn him down. I don't do it on purpose, I do it because that's the word of God. So, <clears throat> we're not to run around, get a bunch of unrepentant rebels to really go to heaven, give them four spirits of love. No, I won't do it. That's a false gospel. I think uh, something I remember from the teaching okay. one or two years ago was uh, along the lines where a uh, preacher was, was preaching and uh, had an invitation. And you know, one fellow in the uh, congregation said, well, yeah. I can accept Christ right here. I don't need to come forward. And I remember the preacher said, well, no, you can't. You know, can. That happened did in two or, three, two or three times. Four, finally, four nights, four nights in a row. Okay. Lawyer, yeah, is nah. it going over his, uh, See, in those days I didn't know any better. Give an invitation at first night of meetings. That's just ridiculous. They're so light tired. Most of them don't know hardly any. Did you hear boiling? All they're looking for like is that? false free tickets to heaven anyway. First night, this godly usher went over to this man, put his hand on his shoulder. He said, Mr., I'll be glad to get down the aisle with you in, in, in the inquiry room. If you repent of your sins and seek the Lord and ask him to save you, turn around like this. I don't need to get out of that aisle. I'll get saved right here. That's good, I should say. No, you can't. Walk away. Second night, same thing. Third night, same thing. Fourth night, same thing. Fifth night. He puts his hand on the again. Same. Sinners, same usher. I'm going to tell you something about that. Sir. He knew more than that preacher. <laughs> he really did. That's not hard. <laughs> he said, Mr. I'll be glad to go down the aisle with you <clears throat> in the inquiry room and pray with you if you repent of your sins and yeah. ask Jesus to save you. Me, okay. <clears throat> Turn around. Here he, water. Water. he really think Jesus could yeah. save yeah. somebody as yeah. terrible, yeah. as selfish, and as simple. You really think he can save me? Yeah. He said, yes, he can. He can save you right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you mean. Isn't that right? Uh, Purity of yeah. heart. Well, most people wouldn't understand that, would they? Just keep adding. He wasn't ready the other night. 
He wasn't ready. Right. That's why I go to a place, I say, first ten sure. times, no, no, no. Finney took, used to take a month before he opened an anxious yeah, seat. Yeah. And those guys would run around town at night looking for mud poles to get down in the praise. I'll show you, God, I'm not proud. <laughs> and he had to move it every night, sleep at a different place. Because they'd be waking up, he was going to sleep all night. Well, most of these preachers never had anybody ever do that to him. But he had to move every night. He wouldn't get any sleep. It's because of what he preached. Mm -hmm. That great heart behind him. Now, Finney said, revival's not a miracle. It comes from four things. Just like a crop of wheat. You do certain things, you're going to get it. You plow and so forth. He said, now, revival comes from preaching truth under the anointing and unction of the Spirit of God with a life of devotion to back it up with a pseudo vow of prayer. There it is. Mm. There it is. Now, we have men and there's that's had a thousand times more prayer than any of that. They never came a country mile of revival. Yet I believe they had the same spirit. I don't believe they had a life to do ocean like him because he got married and he got in revival the next day and didn't see his beloved Lydia for six months. Well, he left most of us there, did <laughs> you get my point? I mean, he left us in devotion. And furthermore, most of them can't read the first page of his systematic theology and get no five words after they read it because they're not used to really thinking. I even took those 18th century words and I put a glossary in the back and give them the same thing in nowadays. Like when Finney says, of necessity. Well, I studied 18th, 19th philosophy. And by the way, it was, you know what's called today? Physics. <laughs> but in that day, it was natural philosophy. But the point is, he was teaching in that. It's not by cause and effect. Of necessity means of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. But they want when they're reading this. Well, I don't understand. Well, look in the back here. I explain it to you what that means. But that's hard work. That's hard work. I don't know anything ever done in this world without hard work. It amounts to anything. Do you? Anybody got any questions? we were talking about the other day about the idea of original sin and the two thoughts that you're born with a sin nature or you're not born with a sin nature and the implications of them are horrendous and we're, we had, I mean it, it's definitely true that it, God would not be right in blaming you for sin that was caused by a sin nature that you had no effect, no right. choice in Right. No choice. So it's evident that you're not born with a sin nature that causes you to sin. But then the problem we ran into is that what makes Romans 3.23 true? Why Why can Paul say that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God if we're not caused to? Well, I don't think you can take that literally because Jesus didn't sin. <laughs> but there's real truth in that. Oh, here's what I think is the reason. When you're born, you don't have enough brains in your head to, to process any truth. So God, in his mercy, has built within us instincts. And now that you've got to define the instincts or it doesn't mean anything. It's an unreflecting urge. Now, when you get hungry, you don't have to say, you start thinking, Oh, yeah, I'm hungry. No, the tummy speaks to you. And uh, when you've got to go to the toilet, you don't stand there. Now, do I have to go or don't I have to go? Oh, yeah, i got to go. You've been jumping around for a minute and couldn't find a place. It's an unreflective urge. All instincts are unreflective urges. Well, between the 30th and 48th month, Jesus Christ caused Romans 1 9 
I mean, John 1, 8. They say to John, are you the Messiah, the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not, the mes I'm not that light. I came to bear witness of that light, that enlighteneth every man that cometh in the world. Enlighteneth. He begins to give us there then what is called intuitive knowledge. Now, intuitive knowledge is not knowledge of ornament. It's knowledge that you were given that you didn't learn. When I was five years old, I knew things not to do and not to say in our house. I'd get myself a whack and a prat. My mother wouldn't allow that kind of language, and even my dad wouldn't. I also knew things not to do in the house. They were not acceptable in our house. Those kids were doing them. Now, how did I know that wasn't acceptable in our house? Because th my folks never preached and taught against it. But I had a knowledge, of not much, but a right and wrong, that between my 40th and 48th month, Jesus began to enlighten my mind as to what's right and what's wrong. This is the light that enlighteneth every man that cometh in the world. That's why, Jacob, we have 1,600 tribes and tongues that we have their list of values or commandments. Every one of them have a law against incest. That, that simply shows me we all came from the first same place. Now, when I lecture on natural law, I show people, if they're really Christians that want to do something for God, I'll show you, I can take any man that's not a Christian, he can call himself an atheist, and I'll prove it to him there is a God, and I'll prove it to him by the evidence in his life. Then I point out the things that every man does. Now, do you know anybody who likes to be cheated? No, no man likes to be cheated. You know anybody that likes to be deceived? No, they get mad, don't they? Now I go down these lists of these things that every man does. I said, well, where do you think you got that from, brother? <laughs> and they're all around the world. My, my friend Re Paris Reed had. He's over in the Congo. He's talking to this Indian chief through an interrupter. <laughs> and he says to him, do you have a system of laws or rules here that you people live by? Oh, yes. What are they? You don't steal. You don't go to bed with your children and this, this, and that. He said, well, what happens to you when you steal? He said, I get fired in my belly. Fired in my belly. He made my conscience. See? God made every man in this world with a conscience. This is why in Romans 1.18 through the rest of the chapter, with, they're all without excuse because of the natural law. Now, the way you can tell the difference between natural law and Moses' law the, the definite article, ho, H-O, when you see that before law, that's Moses' decalogue. But every other time I mention the law is natural law. I wish I had all, that, all my transparencies here, brother. Because I, I can go right up to a man and spend the time with him and say, you're an atheist, huh? Oh, yeah. I don't believe there is an atheist. You got a God, let me follow you 48 yards. I'll tell you what your God is, what you get excited about, what you think about. And I've seen men of God with the Philadelphia Phillies. If that isn't cheating yourself, I'd like to know what is. <laughs> <laughs> I've known men of God with sex. I've known men of God with whiskey. Go to Skid Row, you see a lot of them. I've known men their God was their career or their title. Or their wife. I've seen women, their God was their furniture. Their God was their home. Everybody's got a God for a simple reason. God made man to be a God-centered creature. And he wanted to be at the center of his creature, of his heart. Or I believe there's what we'd call a throne there. So he can rule and reign. That's what we're made for. But if we do not have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maker of heaven and earth, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we'll have a God of our own name. Now, what Christianity is trying to do is to get man to dethrone that false God and let the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come and take up his abode by his blessed Son and Spirit. Now, what's wrong with that? I never saw a person yet I couldn't tell him what his God was if he gave me two days. Now, but this other, though, I show them by the evidence in their life. 
Uh, I, I'm going to give you a good example. In, in my lectures on this, Paul had got this on big slides. I tell about it. his professor. Had a boy in his class, a young kid, 21, 22 years old. And he's always giving him fits about moral absolutes. So one day this kid came in and handed him his paper. And it was on moral relativity. The professor read it. He said, well, research. But he gave him an F. And he wrote down, I do not like blue forward. He handed him in and blew forward. This kid came in in two days. You could have lit a match to him. He'd have gone to Mars. He's so bad. You're arbitrary. You're unfair. You're unjust. What's blue folders got to do with it? He did that on purpose. He did that on purpose. He said, oh, you do believe in moral objectivity. Because <laughs> now you're mad. You, you didn't write what you believe. Now you're acting out what you believe. Get the difference? And I got one whole slide, and the next one I show seven different things we can go after. These guys that say there's no God, by the evidence it would be in their life. And you can do that to any man in the world. And because we have a common origin, and that blessed Son of God begins to put that knowledge into it. No right and wrong at 30 months. You ain't got enough gray matter up there to no know first base from a football crossbar. <laughs> but by the 48th month, now you got some enough up there to process knowledge. And your little will can make a few choices. And that's why Paul said, I was alive once without the law. When? When he's a baby. <clears throat> I was alive once without the law, but when the commandments came in, I sinned, I died. Now, to answer about this, but all have sinned. Mm -hmm. Well, this baby, born, two or three days later, you look at him, you go, oh, you stick a ball in his face. Pretty soon he's, he's gratified, you know, lay there and cool a little bit. Well, five minutes later, now he's colicky, he's got a bubble. Now he's going to let you know that to you, so you pick him up and do this, and that's not a big gulch. No more crying, lay him down. So he lays there, and now he goes to sleep. Uh, in a couple of hours, he wakes up and he's wet, and he's very uncomfortable. He's going to let you know that, too. Now he's going purely by instinct, isn't he? Mm. Ah, but you keep this up for five or six or eight years, this little instincts of his begin to forge a little tiny bondage over the will that when the sensibilities cry out to be gratified, what's he used to doing? Yeah, go ahead and gratify. So that's the reason for that all of sin. Does that answer your question? I think so. I can't do any better now. What was the question? I wasn't here. What was the question, Jacob? It was if if you're not born to the sin nature, why is it true that all of sin is controlled by yeah, but now let me say this. The way to say it is, we're born with a physical depravity that influences but does not cause a moral depravity. Mm -hmm. Now, the more intelligent the parents are, the more they can retard that depravity, that physical depravity that influences mm -hmm. moral depravity. Mm -hmm. I can give you examples of it. Here's my daughter, Faith. She's about seven, eight months old. My mother, wife was going to change her diaper. Well, she'd take the dirty diaper off, put a new one down there, and she's rolling around on the bed. Well, one time she spears her right through the cheeks. <laughs> Boy, she really set up the anvil for us. So the next day, when she tried to put it on, she saw that how they got her mother's goat. Next day, she rolls over. My wife just reached down, she did it. It's not hard. See, she and I believe the spankings, not beatings. Mm -hmm. I said, turn her over. But she didn't cry. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, the next time she changed the diaper, she rolls over. She reached and turned it on. 
put the diaper on. Next day, she's putting the diaper on. She rolls over. She was uh, turned it over. Next day, she didn't roll over. <laughs> <laughs> you get the point? See, my daughter, Nancy, six years old. I come home from work. I got to teach that night. I want to work hours. She sat down at six o'clock. Before I thank the Lord for the food, she says, Honey, just before you got home, Nancy lied to me. I said, Nancy, after dinner, don't you run out there and play with the other kids. You go in your bedroom, you lay down that bed now. Well, she usually eats like a bird. I thought she was going to eat till 8 o'clock. She tried to outweigh me, she didn't think I'll forget. Well, she finally gets up. Bye, Mom and Dad, and going over to Jamie Morris's. I said, No, you're not. You're going in there and lay down that bed. So I went in there and put them in. She laying down. <laughs> Boy, you talk about Helen Hayes. <laughs> a great actress. She made her look like a little theater. <laughs> Run down to I said, Nancy, God gave you to me to raise for him to be a godly woman through whom he could pray things. But Nancy, you lied. Now you broke the law of God. And laws have sanctions. They have if you obey them, you get good sanctions, good consequences. If you break them, you get the penalties. Now, honey, if I don't give you a spanking, he's going to give them to me, and I'll deserve them if I don't give them to you. Now, who do you think ought to get the lick of me or you? Here's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't any louder than you. <laughs> Nothing very forceful there. So she had these little Levi's on it that had the elastic around here. Mind you, you know, as I reached down, I pulled a britches down about her knee, and a little bare bottom was shining at me there. <laughs> and I, I reached down, and I did that. No hard enough. Oh! She let out a blood alert, curdling yell. You just thought Geronimo just coming over the hill? <laughs> oh! It's a good thing there's no use abuse experts around. I've done five years in jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> and. She stopped that yell and I did it again. I did it three times. Each time I got one of those, oh, wailing, blood curling yell, you think I'd kill it, Paul. I pulled him up. I went in and I laid down. I wanted 15 minutes because I had to lecture that night. If I can get 15 minutes of sleep, I'm a new man. About 10 minutes, I hear a little footstep. She gets up and lays right beside me and says, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. I said, Nancy, I love you too. Well, I get up and I go teach. Next night, I had to teach somewhere. Else. So I didn't get home until about 10 o'clock. And I'm sitting down to read the morning newspaper. And I'm sitting there in the living room at 10 o'clock. I hear these little coming down the hallway. In her old nightgown, I said, Ah, oh, you're so cute. She runs around the chair and she gets up in my lap and said, Daddy, I love you. I said, I love you too, Nancy. You're wonderful. She said, Daddy, you know last night when you spanked me? I said, Yes, Nancy, I'll never forget that. She said, Daddy, it didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was I wanting to do? Hurt her? Her teacher was, she said, but Daddy, Learn my lesson. Mm. And I said, that's what I want. I didn't want to hurt you. Because that's what it took for you to learn the lesson. If you learn that, you stop, never lie. Oh, boy, it's going to save you so much trouble all through your life. And if I don't do this, God's going to have to deal with me. Because mm. he gave you to your mother and to me to raise for him. Mm. And I prayed to that precious girl every night of her life. One night I said to her, she's about 12 years, maybe 14. I said, after that, I said, Nancy, you think your daddy loves you? She said, oh, daddy, she says, I know you love me. I said, well, honey, I'm trying to have such a relationship with you 
So you know, you look at God, and you want a relationship with Him. It'll be much better in this room, because He'll know everything, and I don't know hardly anything. But I'm doing this because you're a girl, and you're very, very valuable. And I want to have this as a sort of a idea of what the relationship God wants with you. So about three years later, a girl came to me. She said, Mr. Kahn, you know what I heard your daughter Nancy say about you? I said, no, I don't know. What did she say? She said, my daddy loves me so much that I hope he dies before I do because if I died first, he'd die of a broken heart. Mm. Does that sound like I was too rough on her, Paul? No. I'm trying to teach a man one night to atone. Now listen to this, Jacob. Listen close. And her little room was at least 40 feet from where we were. I didn't know she was listening. And I'm trying to get into his head. When Jesus was in the garden, he wasn't praying to keep from going to the cross. He's praying to make it to the cross. Because the Jews' way of putting a man to death was stoning to death. And if they stoned him to death, he had not died for your sins because he didn't die from physical causes. He died bearing away the sin of the world. And I said, no, it's not physical causes. She's in there listening. She comes out her little Bible, Hebrews 5, 7. Here, Daddy, just what you're talking about. Who in these days when he had offered up strong prayers and supplications unto him who was able to save him from death and was heard. Where was he heard? In the garden and up to Calvary. And that's so that God would help him. They wouldn't abuse him to death before he got to Calvary. And he brought that. Cyrene along, a black man, to help him carry the cross, but it was to make it to Calvary. He never shrank from it one sixty-fourth of one inch or one ten thousand. He was praying to make it. Why don't these preachers preach it like that? Especially when they have the Good Friday service in the last seven words or something like that. How about giving us some meats? Boy, when I, and here's a little girl. How young is she? She knew that. She learned that. And one preacher out of a hundred knows that. But does it sound, gentlemen, like I've been too legalistic with those kids? Uh, and when I go to play some whole crusade, I don't have to beg them to get in. Oh, Daddy, we'd like to go over here and go swim with these kids. No, no, they're sitting there. I don't have to beat that into them because they know my, their mother and I love to serve the Lord and we get great joy and great peace in doing it, and they do too. Wouldn't know what we're made for, Paul? We don't do it every night. But I have done it sometimes every night for a month almost and didn't think I was a martyr. Didn't think I ought to get anything special for it. I'm just grateful that a great God like that, a little school speck of sand like me worked for me. My kids, you ought to see their kids. You ought to see them. Nothing legalistic. That help you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. That thing about the unreflective urges. And how it begins to affect the will. And because they have learned now, when one of my sensibilities cry out, well then, if I make a little record, I do something, I get to gratify. Well, when you begin to understand the difference between right and wrong, real difference, as Paul said, Romans 9 1, they choose to do their own, they die spiritually. Now they need to be born again. But a kid at that time, like five, six, eight, seven, eight, or nine. No, 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 no. I have another question, which might be just because of my pillow stupidity. Jacob, but, can I just interrupt you for a second? Well, Harry, um, what would you like to do for lunch? Would you rather have sandwiches here? Would you like to get some hoagies? Would you like to go out? We want to just plan, that's all. Just well, I'd really like to go out. I don't care where. Okay. No. 
uh, I'm in mm. so much, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I get TV or something. For <laughs> I've already got TV tavern belly here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when we're done here, we'll go out there. Yeah. All right. Doesn't matter where or what we get to. Eat. Okay. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> we didn't. We'll, we'll excuse you. <laughs> Um, now, I guess the question would be Jesus. Like, he was born. I mean, I know he's God and he's man. Okay, which is a little hard to understand. But he was born as a man, but yet he was without sin. Now it doesn't. Now the same influences were present in his life. That's right. Why? But an influence is not a sin. Right. Go ahead. I guess. Why? You start playing with it, though, it'll be skin pretty soon. Right. <laughs> why is it that. Why didn't he sin? I mean, I mean, I know he was God. Well, let me, not... let me say this to you. In the first place, mm -hmm. if we're born with a sinful nature and he wasn't, then he wasn't tempted in all points like we right. are. So that, that, that's foolishness, mm -hmm. even we are according to the Word of God. And there ought to be a verse in there somewhere that says that, and it doesn't anywhere. I was speaking down at a big conference in Washington, D.C. I said, I challenge any man in this place, pastor, theologian, you show me where in the Bible it says you're born of a sinful nature. And we'll debate it here in front of them. Not a one of them stood up because they knew I, I, I could keep that thing, mm -hmm. that what I'm saying. Now, I don't see what your problem is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the point would be, if every man, save Christ, was born, and as he grew up, he sinned. What was what what was the reason that Christ did not? Well, let me say this to you: mm -hmm. when he picked the Virgin Mary, the Catholics eulogized her. But let me tell you something: she wasn't one thousand of an inch in devotion. And obedience to God, then that guy chose him. He was something. God was very, very careful about who he picked out. What a man. Because, listen, they're making fun of him. You're going to the girl, pregnant, you say you haven't touched her. In fact, his, those mean, those mean, pharisaical people, they came to Jesus one day and they said, We know who our father is, as if to say, You bastard. He said, Jesus didn't take everything laying down. He said, yeah, you are your father, the devil. <laughs> See? What a mean thing they said to him. But don't forget the bringing up that he had by the Virgin Mary and by Joseph. And they had their ambitions and their priorities straight. And they knew they had someone very, very unusual here. And he sure was. His own mother knew that. But one of the great things about it, it wouldn't have him raised back there in Jerusalem. No, no, no. That's no that's no place for it. I can show you things he said. If he had set him in Jerusalem, they'd have killed him for it. Mm -hmm. You remember when the yeah. centurion came to him, came to him, he said, Lord, my, my servant is sick of a fever. Yeah. Would you please heal him? Because I'm a man also on authority. And I say, go, and they go. And I say, come, and they come. You just, Jesus said, I'll come and see him. He said, no, you just say the word. He said, I get this. Oh, I've not seen so great a faith in all Israel. And this guy's a Gentile. <laughs> and there was another woman just like him in Matthew 15. Boy, I love to preach on that. But when he came along, the woman from Sidon, and she, she tried to grab a hold of him, and my daughter is vexed with the devil. And then he's a disciple, they're chasing her away. She said, no, no, he didn't. He finally turned to her. He said, lady, don't you know I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel? She said, yeah, true, Jesus. But don't even know. The lost sheep, don't even the dogs get crumbs from the table? Oh, dear lady, I've not seen so great a faith in all Israel. Here's two Gentiles, they'd have killed him for that, wouldn't they? Yeah. But she was light years spiritually ahead of those 
stiff necked Pharisee back there because she recognized him as he was the sinless son of God, the Messiah. And David, let me say this. If you take all those words there literally, and I preached on this many times, Jesus had five flaws in his character if you take them literally. But no, these stiff necked apostles, they're like teaching a block of wood. Oh, yeah, the altar. When he sent them out in 10th chapter, only go to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Don't go over here now across the Jordan. You only go to the lost sheep of Israel. You know why? Well, Judaism was so, so corrupt, so legalistic, they weren't even allowed to shake hands with a Gentile. They weren't allowed to eat with it. weren't allowed to stay at their house. So what if they go over to Decapolis, a city of ten cities, and they're preaching over there? It gets noon, they're hungry. Hey, fellas, how about calling quits and come to our house? We'll have lunch. Oh, no, no. We can't go to your house. Why? You're a Jew, or you're a Gentile. They're still wrapped up in that. And they say, now get dark at night. Come on, stay in the house. No, no, we can't come to your house. Where do they get that out of the Bible? That stuff, they've added to it. And they had so much of that, this is a part of that training to make them so they're going to go to the whole world. Not just to the Jews, but so then, Five things, if you take them literally, flaws in his character. First, he was insensitive to her, wasn't he? He paid no attention to her. She kept on following. And then he said, don't you know I'm only sent to the lost sheep and tribe of Israel? Bless God, he's got the, new, the Great Commission in there 60 times. <laughs> if that's to be taken literally, he perjured himself. And I can show you five flaws there if you take a literal, but it's not to be taken literal. And he's... Apostles, there's glory are they getting a lesson from this woman. Well, that would humble them, wouldn't it? <laughs> you get that? That's Matthew 15. And there's no other explanation of that that will make any sense. And sometimes, son, I, when we get into moral government, I'll show you things in the New Testament you cannot understand apart from the providential government of God. And the Calvinists don't believe in providential government. I'll give you an example. Here came Jesus, toward John, his cousin, to be baptized. John said, man, Jesus, what are you talking about? I need you baptize me. He said, no, that the word of God might be fulfilled, cousin. He baptized me. So he takes him down in the water and he baptized him. Then the Spirit descended like as a not a dove, but like as a dove. And a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved Son. There's the whole Trinity right there together. There's Jesus, the Spirit of God, and there's the Father. Then I preach a call me up from Hagerstown. Indiana's <coughs> brother here, we got one of these Jesus only that are stealing all our sheep here in town. It's just Jesus only. How, how can I handle it? And I took him into that one right there. There's the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you're going back into 3 John 9 where it says, Any man come to you and have not the doctrine of both the Father and the Son, treat him as anathema. Well, now, this particular thing that we're talking about, wait a minute, what was I talking about there before? Huh? One from Sidon? Yeah, no, just. Um, Joseph and Jesus' suffering and why he didn't sin. No, no, too far back. Just, mm -hmm. just a minute ago. Five character flaws? Just, no. Take just things literally? The moral the government and governmental providence. Providence, yeah. yeah. Calvinists don't believe in providence. Okay. So, you see all this? And ten, within ten days, he's over in that local Bastille. <laughs> Jail, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. he'd been making those cracks about hair to have his brother's wife. Mm -hmm. He said, nah, see, he's been under providential government all his life. Because when he's a baby in the womb, it says, God's Spirit chose him right then. He's under the providential government of God. Now that's when God moves upon a person to do things. He's really not aware that God is doing that. Like when he hired Pharaoh's heart. 
he'd already hired him, and now he gave him a real case of arterial sclerosis. Arterial sclerosis. Mm -hmm. So that now he would need ten times, didn't he? Well, that my mighty wonders might be performed, that's why. These poor old stiff neck Jews, they didn't know much about God. They're only 400 years old. As a, and so he says, I'm going to harden his heart so he'll not let it go. So the guy, the guy goes down in there to take a bath in the River Nile, and he has him cast his, his rod down, right? What happened to the River Nile? Turned to blood. Turned to blood, and that guy's taking a bath in. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? Every one of those really twelve plagues was God showing he's a God of power. Mm -hmm. He's a God of authority. Well, they're to learn things about him now. But he had done all that to reveal himself. All right, now then, that's providential government. Now man gets no reward nor any penalty when God is a causation behind it because what he's doing is not stemming from any right or wrong attitude or disposition of heart. This is a great thing in the gov moral government of God, the providential government of God, and you will not understand that Bible apart from it because about 12 to 14% of that Bible is made up of providential government, and the Calvinists hate that term. They don't even understand it, Paul. All right, now then, here's Jesus, John the Baptist. It's been, all his preaching has been done under the providential government of God. Now Jesus says, boy, there'll be some of you standing here, not taste the death you see the kingdom of God. But he said, nevertheless, the least of you here, you're going to be greater in the kingdom of God than the greatest preacher ever born in woman. Why is that? Because all his preaching was done under providential government and didn't stem from his free will. And you, Paul, and you, brother, and you, you can bring more joy to the heart of God than John could because he was caused to do what he did. Now, here he is. Now he's, he's done his work. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. Follow him. This thing, a preacher saying, no, Christ must increase, you must decrease. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying... Paul, John, your ministry is finished. Now, you're going to be arrested. You're going to jail. I'll see you, cuz. So he goes to jail for what he said, but Herod having his brother's wife. Nah, he's in the clink. Now, he gets his, some of his disciples. I want you to go over and see my cousin, Jesus. I want you to say to him, Art thou he or should we look for another? Paul, what's the difference what he's saying here and what he said when Jesus came toward him? Behold, the Lamb of God, not a Lamb, the Lamb, that taketh away the sin of the world. But now over here he is, the causation of God is off of him. It's no longer providence of God. If he's going to get to heaven, he's got to make up his own mind. So he says,